Today I've got a request for a talk, it's usual that I encourage people if they want me to talk about the Buddhist attitude to this or that, I'm very happy to do so. And the talk which somebody suggested this evening was the subject we've covered before here over the years but it will always come up again and again and again because it's a subject of death. It will come up again and again and again because all you guys and girls sitting here are all day gonna, all, all going to die one day. And that is for sure. <laughs> I wonder when it's going to be. <laughs> so here we're going to be talking about the Buddhist attitude to death and dying and grief and all of that. But it also illustrates the attitude towards life as well. Because you cannot take away one from the other. No more than you can separate night and day. You can separate sort of uh, um, heat and cold. The two go together, life and death. But uh, in my own story as a monk, as many of you know, I spent nine years, the first nine years of my life in northeast Thailand. And at that time, in northeast Thailand, it had never been colonized by any Western power, and it was a remote area, so remote that in many places where I went, I was the first Westerner some of the Thai people had seen. Now as a monk you go on arms round every morning. I remember a couple of times going into these villages on arms, food, on arms round. And the villagers were supposed to actually to put food into your bowl. And the rule was that you're not supposed to look at the monk, you're supposed to pay attention to you know, what you're doing. Take out the rice and put it in the monk's bowl. But I remember a couple of times in these villages, these you know, young girls who were putting food in the, the monk's bowls, they've been doing every day since they were very young. When they saw a white monk, they couldn't help but sort of looking up with their mouths open. I didn't mind that so much, but when they tried to put rice in the bowl, they missed. <laughs> they fell on the ground. <laughs> happened a lot they had to put some other rice in afterwards. <coughs> well, that was at the remote area which I, I went to. And also, secondly, that because it was a culture which had never been westernized, it was actually a completely different way of looking at many things. I always used to tell people that one of the things which I learned, you know, in my first months in northeast Thailand, because it was a completely different culture, we used to go from place to place in like utes. You know, these are pickup trucks. And the pickup truck would have a metal railing sort of over the top on which a canvas was stretched. And that was actually just supposed to protect you from the rain or even the dust, because they're all like dirt roads. But the roads were, being dirt roads and being a monsoonal land, those roads were always needing to be repaired. There's always potholes and ruts in it. And being a young monk, you had to sit in the bank. You know, the senior monks could sit in the front in the cab. They were okay. But sitting in the back, whenever you went over a pothole and the ute went down, the car went down, I went up and you hit your head, you crack your head hard on these metal railings and my goodness it hurt and you didn't have much padding on your head like many of you have <laughs> so every time I hit my head just like any westerner would do you swore <laughs> but I swore in English hoping that the Thais wouldn't understand me <laughs> which they didn't but they understand I was, you know, I was upset. But when those Thai monks hit their head, sometimes the pothole was so deep, even those short ties would, would go up to the roof and hit their head as well. And they laughed. They just I thought it was hilarious. And I couldn't understand what they were up to. When I saw it happen two or three times, they hit their head and they laughed. I came to the conclusion that those guys must have hit their head too many times. <laughs> <laughs> they were crazy. <laughs> but, being a scientist, being a rationalist, I decided to do an experiment. The next time I hit my head, I decided I would laugh and see what happens. You know what I found out? I found out if you hit your head and laugh, it hurts much less. It's true, it hurts much less. 
And if you don't believe me, ask the person sitting next to you <laughs> to give you a big crack on the head <laughs> and laugh and see if it works. It's true. What was actually happening there was a completely different attitude to one of the things which I was... A, a different attitude to one of the experiences of life which was quite common, like pain, hurt, even sickness. I don't know where this came from. Maybe it was Buddhist, but it was certainly culturally embedded. They would laugh when they hurt themselves, and instead of swearing. There was a different cultural response. And similarly, I was fascinated to see at the time of a death, again, there was no tears, there was no grief, there was no swearing in their heart. It was a completely different cultural response. And to see in a death, there was a sense of peace and a sense of acceptance of what was happening. It wasn't that they were crazy or mad from hitting their head in the back of trucks for too long. It was actually real. And the monastery in which I lived, for most of the time, was the local cremation ground for all of the villagers around. That's why there's heaps and heaps of ghosts in that monastery. Probably more ghosts than there were monks but we live together in harmony and peace. <coughs> because it's so often that uh, they were hoarding people in to get cremated in the cremation grounds in this monastery. And of all the cremations I saw, there's only, in nine years, only once did I see a woman cry, and that was only just one or two tears, and she, she quick, quickly wiped away. There was never grief there. And it wasn't as if <coughs> they were holding anything back. Because you would see the whole families in the village, day in, day out. It was almost like your family. The village was your extended family. After coming to Australia, I remember going back there after four or five years. And they missed me. I'd been in that place for nine years, and I'd gone away for about five years. When I went back, on the first day on arms run in the village, the ladies once again looked up and started crying, you're back. It was a very, very sweet and touching experience because in all those years you became part of the family, part of the village. And so I knew all those people and when they, somebody died, they just didn't cry, they didn't feel sad, they didn't have that grief. What I learned from that experience was grief is a culturally ad addition onto loss. And it was actually powerful to know that that wasn't always necessary. Not that you should feel guilty if you feel grief, but you shouldn't feel guilty if you don't feel grief as well. There may be another way of dealing with it. And <coughs> in the years I've been in Australia now, you know, giving many, many funeral services, I know all the funeral directors well by name because <laughs> I spend so much time with them. And they're very, very funny people. Actually, some of the funeral directors, there's funeral stories again. You know, when you, know, you do a funeral service, and because you know, they're always dealing with um, uh, people in pain and sorrow, that I suppose they overreact because they always tell me their jokes. And this is so funny, some of these. One funeral director in particular, sort of, I always remember him. He was an Irish funeral director. And I was going to do a funeral. And once he saw that I had a sense of humour, he didn't let up at all. He told me joke after joke after joke. And my goodness, some of them were funny. So when actually we got to actually the crematorium, I was in the hearse and he was sitting next to me. And I told him, please be quiet. I've got to do a funeral now. But he wouldn't. As we led the, the funeral cortege in the cemetery to the graveside, he kept on telling me more jokes and every now and again nudging me in the arm. <laughs> I said, look, there's a family behind here. They're grieving. They're dead. But he wouldn't stop. And it was very difficult for me. I told him about one minute before we actually got to the crematorium to the chapel. I said, look, shut up. Be quiet. You know, I can't, <laughs> can't go in here just with a big smile on my face. <laughs> But in some countries you can do that. In Australia we're supposed to grieve 
It seems to be accepted in, in many, many places. And because I've been going to so many funeral services, what I, I've noticed is that when people go into those chapels, those churches, or wherever they perform the ceremony, there's always every now and again young kids come in. They're children, four, five, six. And they're full of life, playing, and they're teasing each other, and they're being mischievous. And they come in with a smile, with life, with the energy of a, of a young person. And then they see their parents, grandparents, uncles, all looking sad and morose. And how many times I've seen this, this child just looks up and sees this sadness in their parents' and their elders' eyes and get all confused and afraid. And then they cry as well. That's actually how children learn grief from their parents and elders. I can see how it is culturally added on. If parents, elders would only act more peacefully, they would give the children a chance to understand that death is part of life. And as such, that we can look at the whole experience in a far different way. Now in all traditions, or religious traditions, you know, we know that something happens after death. And uh, what happens after death in Buddhism is like rebirth. If it's Christianity, uh, Judaism, Hinduism. Hinduism is also reincarnation. In other religions it's just one reincarnation up to some heaven world somewhere or up to some hell world, realm or whatever. It's amazing in those uh, religions. No one ever says about someone going down to hell. A lot of times because obviously people don't deserve that. But certainly we understand that there is something which happens after death. And I was telling people, some person uh, just today, just this evening, the people I was talking to before I came in here, the reason why I was a bit late, were some old friends and uh, a pair of like twins. And the, one of them died just a couple of days ago and they were coming, they were just came here to visit me during their wake they were having for their, their brother. So again, it's fresh in my mind, stories about sort of death and how to cope with death. And again, that... Uh, I quoted a little article in The Lancet, the Journal of the British Medical Association, entitled, sort of, Consciousness Survives Death, written by some doctors in the Netherlands who had done an in-depth study about what actually happens to you when you die, medically. And they've found so much evidence that when the brain stops, when a person is medically dead, some people actually remember and recall, and they recall so clearly, there's no way they can imagine those things. What they're actually saying, that according to their research, that consciousness survives death. And it's important for us to know that, because once we understand what actually happens at death, then perhaps we won't be so afraid of it, and we won't have so much shock at death, and we won't grieve the death of another. It's not only sort of doctors, but people have so many anecdotal experiences of what happens when a person dies. Either because they die and get brought back to life again, they die only temporarily thanks to advances of modern science and medicine, they get resuscitated and they learn to tell the tale. Or that sometimes people remember their past lives and actually say what actually happens. And it's standard that when a person dies, they leave their body, floating up outside of their body. When you actually leave your body, it is a very pleasant experience. I remember reading an article in the, I think it was the Australian, about one of our politicians, I think Graham Edwards, who stepped on a mine in Vietnam while helping a friend and blew his legs off. The next thing he knew after this, incredible pain of stepping on a mine in the Vietnam War and having his legs completely reduced to jelly. He was actually floating up, this is his words which I remember from the article, floating up above the paddy fields of Vietnam without a care in the world. So happy, so peaceful, so blissful. That's an experience which just about everybody has 
when they leave their body, either because of some accident or because of some injury <coughs> or because of uh, you know, some operation which goes wrong. Floating up outside and feeling so peaceful, so light. For those of you who practice Buddhist meditation and get deep you know, into your mind, <coughs> sorry, in, into your mind, exactly the same thing is happening. In meditation, what we're doing, we're consciously settling down the five senses and the body to the point where the body just almost disappears. We get to the realm of the mind, which is so peaceful, so nice. It's as if this body is a big burden. And in meditation, we leave that burden behind. We free ourselves, we free the mind from the body. Same thing happening at death, freeing your mind from this very hard and heavy body. And this is actually what happens. In Buddhism we call this the mind-made body. The mind-made body which leaves a physical body. And this is actually explains why many people see ghosts and what ghosts actually are when a person dies or when they leave their body. That's actually the same as the ghost body. One of our, our members some time ago, he could leave his body at will. So when he went to Darwin, to do some work on contract, he would come back to Perth every now and again to check up on his wife. <laughs> and his wife knew he was around, he said, you know, get out of here, go back to Darwin. There's <laughs> another guy, he was uh, one of the prisoners I used to teach meditation to in Incarnate, next to our monastery. He also could leave his body. His interesting case that when he was, he was a Yugoslavian, when he was a young boy back in Europe, in Yugoslavia, he had some terrible sickness and the doctors had to operate on him. And as the operation was going on, that he died. He left his body, <coughs> floating up above the body. And one of the interesting parts of this is that he knew intuitively that what, what was wrong and that the doctors in the operating theatre were actually looking, observing in the wrong part of the body so they couldn't actually see what the problem was. He just willed the doctors to look somewhere else. He was only about a seven or eight year old boy at the time. <coughs> and as soon as he willed the doctors to actually to look where he knew the problem was, one of the doctors turned their head, saw the problem, alerted everyone else, and they saved his life. <laughs> From that time on, he said he could always leave the body at will. Which was why, when he was in prison in Western Australia, he could go and watch the movies whenever he wanted, and no one could stop him. <laughs> That's what he told me, he said it didn't really matter being in jail. <laughs> he could always leave and they couldn't, couldn't catch him. But this is what happens when a person actually dies. You may have seen movies about this, you may have seen documentaries, you may have even had experiences of that yourself. Please understand, if you haven't had those experiences yourself, please read of other people's experiences. Because that shows you what happens when you die. And it's not just Buddhists or Hindus who have these experiences, everybody, it doesn't matter who. What it actually shows you is that consciousness does survive death. And again, the ghosts are very great examples of that. Because what happens very often when a person dies, what would happen when you die? What would you want to do? First thing is because of your attachment, your care, your love, you want to go and make sure everybody else is okay. A big shock has happened in the family and you want to make sure that everyone feels you're okay and that everything's okay. That's why that very often people see ghosts or hear them just after a person dies. And all that is, is that person who's just died just want to make sure that everyone else realises they're okay. That they're at peace. They want to just make sure everything is settled. One of those ghost stories just happened in, in this suburb. Some years ago, one of our members, he was an Englishman, when he was sleeping at night, woke up in the middle of the night, midnight, 1am or something, turned on the, the bed lamp, and the end of his bed was his mum, was standing there. His mother lived in Essex, in England. In the middle of the night, there was his mum standing at the end of his bed. 
I've been telling me it's the only time in his life he's seen a ghost, a real dinky die ghost, not imagining it, there with the lights on, seeing it as clear as could be. Straight away he realised Mum was dead. He said the other thing which he always remembers from that experience, that he wasn't at all scared or afraid. Seeing her, he felt so good, so happy. But his mother had visited him. And his mother smiled. And that smile sort of showed her love to him. And he smiled back. And he said he just stood, he just sat there in bed, just looking silently at his mum, smiling, showing their love silently. And after two or three minutes, his mother just faded into nothing, just completely disappeared. And then, this is the part of the story which I like telling, then being an Englishman, he did what any Englishman is trained to do, he got up and made himself a cup of tea. (laughs) 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 And drinking his cup of tea, the telephone rang, and the telephone was, he answered it, and it was his sister in London. And he said, Pete, terrible thing has happened. He said, yeah, I know, Mum has died. How did you know? Said the sister in England. we just come back from the hospital. Mum has just been to visit me. Isn't that a wonderful story? About if your parent died or your child died a long way away, isn't it wonderful they can come and visit you? and say goodbye. That's just one story among, among heaps and heaps. I know that last year, or earlier this year, I forget which, Ajahn Tatamlo started talking about ghosts, and he went on for two hours. And I don't want to <laughs> go into that, all the ghost stories again, even though that some of you say, okay, go for it, but no, this is about death and dying. But what it actually shows is that consciousness does survive death, and once a person dies, it's usually a very peaceful experience and usually they're very happy afterwards. As Graham Edwards said, he floated above the paddy fields of Vietnam without the care of the world, so happy. For him, it was only his memory of his young wife and child back in Australia. He'd just been married, a young soldier, and his wife had a kid. That memory brought him back into his body. He still had business to do, still had duties. And as soon as he came into the body, the pain of the body was so immense, he just immediately sort of went unconscious. And the next thing he knew, he was in a hospital being treated in great pain. And this is what happens when you die. This is standard Buddhism. It's, all, it, it's good to know this, because then you're not afraid when somebody's dying, or dead rather. It's a great release for them. They're at peace, they're happy, they're having a good time. It's only afterwards when they get reborn again, or whatever, when they get the trouble start again, when they have to get nappies again, or go to school, and all that sort of stuff. You know, it's, you know some of those stories which I say about people being reborn, and then actually speaking. There's quite a few stories of actually people who have actually talked when they were just freshly born. I think I told this not so long ago, in Waysack or something, but the first time this happened, here in Nolamara, a couple of Australians, came up, they weren't Buddhists, so they came up and said that their, their young t- baby, only a few weeks old, had actually spoken. What had happened, it was, Peter was the older son, two or three years of age, and I think, forget what the other kid was, I always forget his name, called him John, was the, uh, was the little, little baby. And when it was time to go to bed, the parents told sort of, uh, Peter, you know, please go up to bed. And so he went, before he went to his bedroom, he went to say good night to his young baby brother, only two or three weeks old. Good night, John. Stupid, you know, talking to a baby like that, isn't it? Saying good night, John. What do you expect the baby to do? But this baby surprised everybody by saying good night, Peter. <laughs> only a couple of weeks old. And the parents couldn't believe this. They were just so <coughs> shocked. They stopped what they were doing. They stared in, in awe at the, the pram. And their older son obliged them by saying once more, Good night, John. And this time with both of them watching, clearly, 
they actually heard the the baby two weeks or something say good night Peter unmistakably it spoke and that's why they came here because they were spooked what's going on please explain <laughs> never spoke again for, for months until it started speaking again interestingly it spoke in adult speech not in baby talk and I've been collecting such stories there's another couple in Perth whose baby also spoke when it was born a Malaysian Chinese couple and the best story of all of quite a few stories was in the United States when a baby came out of the womb in front of the doctors and midwives in the hospital the young newly born only one or two hours old spoke and the words it said go down in my history book because what it said was oh no not again <laughs> There we go again. <laughs> Great story. And true, that's what happens. So we actually we understand that when a person is actually born, they're not coming from nowhere. They're not an image of their parents, as all mothers know. When you give birth to a child, that's a being with a history, with a personality very different than from you and your husband. You know that. It's an old being coming into this life, which is why I gave a talk at Christchurch yesterday, at the grammar school. And it was <laughs> very sweet. This little boy came up and said, you know, as a school boy, is it okay to fall in love? He was only 16, and he was deeply in love with a nice girl. So, yeah, of course it is. Nothing wrong with that. What do you expect? And I explained it to him that sometimes, uh, you know, that you can actually see a partner from your past life, someone you've known before. Love at first sight is not love at first sight at all. It's love at second, third, so many sights. An old person you've known before, and you meet again. That's why you you feel you've known that person. And so the understanding sort of this the way that life works. When somebody dies, it's not such a big deal anymore. It's not the end of things. It's just like a, a phase. It's just a, a, a passage from one life to another. There are these huge numbers of lives we've lived. Actually, as Buddhists, you've died many times. You've been born many times which is why I call all Buddhists born-again Buddhists. <laughs> Having an understanding of rebirth takes away a lot of the pain of death. When my father died, I've got lots of stories about my father's funeral, but one of the stories which actually really made a big impact on me, my father was an atheist. My mother was sort of Church of England, but she never went to church. And when my father died, just the funeral directors, you now they were trying to organize things. What religion are you? He said, no, none really. When you put none, they put C of E, Church of England. So that, you know, she was too sort of uh, worried about uh, the fact that she lost her husband to really worry about such things. So when we had the funeral service, the cremation, there was an old Anglican priest who gave the service. And first of all, as soon as I saw this, I thought, hang on, my father was an atheist, he didn't believe in you. But nevertheless, you know, he gave a sermon. But then, when he gave his sermon, he started saying about my father, what a wonderful man he was and how great he was. And straight away, that I sort of closed up to that sermon. I said, but you don't even know my father. How can you say such things? You're not being honest. For me, religion had to be honest. And actually, I was really, that was one thing which would disturb me. And I remember having a sort of uh, a determination, a resolution, to say, if ever, at that time, must have been I knew I was going to be a monk sometime, because I said, if ever I am doing a funeral service, I will never act like that. You know, just to try and uh, cheer people up, you know, to say things which I didn't know about somebody. 
never argue with a funeral for someone I don't know. I just say, I just don't know this guy or that girl. But it's what the family said, the Sarah is an okay guy. That's as much as I can say. Because honesty was so important at the time of a death, even more important than other times. And so the honesty at the time of a death is crucial. So when I give a funeral or talk to people, we just you know, talk to people with honesty that it's a good chance you'll see that person again. Don't say you will, but I can say with true honesty because according to Buddhist theories of rebirth, we do tend to get reborn together in groups. In the, in the Buddhist scriptures, all the, like the Buddhist chief disciples were also disciples or friends or brothers and sisters in previous lives. And even just one of the, uh, the great monks who told of, uh, of a time before when he was a king and all of his disciples, his senior monks in his last life were his ministers in lives before. Even the, one of the early Buddhists who wrote this book about Buddhism in England, this was a high court judge, Christmas Humphreys in England, who wrote these books and gave Buddhism a, a, a respectable name in England many, many years ago. And he went on the BBC once talking about his past lives. He could remember his past lives. He could remember his wife from his previous life, who he met again in this life and became one of his closest friends. But not his wife, he married somebody else. But it's interesting, just his wife from a previous life, because of emotional bonds, craving or whatever, became his best friend in his last life. He died you know, some years ago. It's another example of how we do tend to sort of to link together with ties of attachment, love, whatever, and get reborn again in similar lives. Not always the same. Sometimes brothers can be parents, sisters can be daughters, or wives or whatever. We tend to go in groups. That's why I tell people when you die, when they die, it doesn't matter, they'll probably see them again. It's interesting, there's another couple here. There's a Thai tradition. If a child dies very young, sometimes what they do is they mark a part of the body with a pen. Because if the wife gets pregnant again, they want to see if there's a birthmark there. As if the person who was to be born didn't quite make it the first time, they're going to come the second time. Yeah. And this particular couple, their first child died when it was born, was stillborn. Even they, did, they had an ultrasound a couple of days before the birth, everything was fine. But in those two days before the birth, the child turned round and choked itself on the umbilical cord. So it was still born. They called it Charlie. And I did the funeral service. While I wasn't looking, they told me afterwards, they got a simple biro pen and put a little line on the heel of the foot. You're not supposed to have birthmarks on that part of the body, the heel. And some months, it was their first child. Some months later, she got pregnant again, gave birth to a time a girl. But that girl had a little mark on her heel. It was Charlie. Didn't make it the first time, but second time lucky. Do you believe that? It's very common. So sometimes it's as if somebody close to us wants to come into our life. So when we actually have someone close to us die, never think you'll never see them again. Trouble is, the next time you meet them, you probably won't recognize them because there'll be someone a little bit different, although that sometimes something inside of you knows that, yeah, there's somebody there, which I know, I've known before. But when a person dies, sometimes uh, we think what's been taken away rather than what we've had. So we always, in Buddhism, look about celebrating the life, not mourning the death. This is most important, and all of you know that famous story of my father's death when I never cried because I compared his life to a concert. At the end of every concert, 
everybody, if it's a great concert, a great musical or whatever, you stand up and shout for more. Often the band, the orchestra, carries on for a while, but eventually they have to put away their instruments and go home. And so do you. After every concert I ever went to, I never felt sad that the music had ended. Do you ever feel sad after a great concert? Do you ever go crying and saying it's all over? Or always after a great concert you feel inspired, uplifted, moved. What a marvellous performance that was. How lucky I was to have been there at the time. And that's actually how I felt when my father died. Just like the end of a great concert. I was moved by his life. And as I remember walking out of that crematorium in Mortlake, I never felt sad, but I felt uplifted, inspired. What a great life that was, and how lucky I was to have known that man for 16 years. That's how I feel now. There's other things about the life of somebody who was so close to you, which was also important to me, and which actually changed the way I perform funeral services. One of the things was that when a person dies, there's always some unfinished business. Especially if they die, <coughs> well, even if they die slowly, and you've got time to actually to try and arrange things properly. There's always some things unfinished. And certainly when my father died, because I was only 16, one of the things which was unfinished was a lot of guilt things which I had done and said which I shouldn't have done, things which I should have said which I didn't. And that sort of after a while sort of started to eat at me, especially I remember because I was growing up, 16 year old, my favourite musician was Jimi Hendrix and had a lot of his records. My father used to like Frank Sinatra when he played his Frank Sinatra records, because I was rebellious, I put on my Jimi Hendrix records at top volume and drowned out his Frank Sinatra. <laughs> I felt so guilty about that when I when he, at his funeral and afterwards. And also some of the other things which, you know, for a father or a mother, at 16 you're not really emotionally mature enough actually, to say how much you love your parents actually go up and say to them that how much you respect them and value them for what they've given you. When he died, I thought I'd never have the chance again. It was actually great when I heard about Buddhism. Well, I got into Buddhism, I was already a Buddhist before then, but when I really got into it and found out that you can still say sorry. You know just how we can feel our relations our close relations or children, when something happens to them that we know that something has happened. A friend in Sydney was a Buddhist. He literally, when he was young, ran away with a circus. And he joined the elephant trainer. And he told me in Sydney some time ago that one day he was travelling with the, all the caravans you know, from one place to another in New South Wales when the elephant just he went crazy, started trumpeting and stamping his feet on the ground. They had to stop you know, the caravan and try and settle this elephant down. I didn't know what had spooked him. They looked in his cage, if there was any sort of mice or any animals or something there, or if he was sick, and they couldn't find out what. It took him about five minutes to calm this elephant down. It was only after they calmed him down that they got the message that the head elephant trainer had just had a fatal car accident a few kilometres up the road. As soon as the, uh, that man died, the elephant knew and went crazy. Recently in Melbourne, they told me that it was in one of the Melbourne papers. A vet had been travelling to a party. It was the end of the week, end of the week he'd finished his work, he was going to a party, feeling excited, now looking forward to a good time, and suddenly along the road he's just overcome with immense emotions. 
So much so he just had to stop the car and cry. He didn't know why, what was going on. And when he got himself together after five or ten minutes, he carried on to the party with somebody with a message waiting for him that his dog had died. Exactly at that time. Has things like that ever happened to you? When somebody has died, or a close relation, even a pet, has been in trouble, you feel there's something wrong? If you're close to someone, they can feel you. They know you. They know if something's happening. Especially if you're sensitive. It doesn't matter where my dad has been reborn. You can always resonate with that being at any time. Anyone who's close to you, you've been close to them. There's some way of contacting them in the same way that when somebody's in trouble, close relations know that and they feel that. If you're having a good time, very happy. They know that, they feel that. That sort of mind-to-mind -mind contact, which you know, monks sometimes get into when they do their meditation. Understanding people's minds, feeling them, resonating with them. It's just sensitivity, that's all. That sensitivity is there quite naturally to people who've lived together for a long time. Even with animals, they know if you're hurting, even a long way away. I had this book, I forget what I did with it, it's an interesting book about animals and how they can resonate with their owners. This uh, TV company, in, I think it was in Netherlands, they did one of these lovely documentaries about animals and their owners and just to prove you know, that these things existed, they took two cameras, one was actually at home with the dog, the other one with, with its owner, sort of a woman. And the woman said every time, every time she came home, that dog was actually waiting at the window for her. Even when she came at odd hours, the dog would be waiting at the window. The rest of the time would just be sleeping and lazing around. So the cameras, one camera was in the house following the dog, the other one was you know, following the lady. And this TV company, I think they, whether it was with a, a dice or they had randomly told her when to come home. And they synchronized the cameras so you could actually see, so I was told in this book, when the lady was told to go home. At that precise moment, the dog got up and went to the window to wait for her. The dog knew, even at many miles away, when that woman was coming home. It was resonating. And of course, you all know the story of our monastery cat, Kit Kat. Those of you who've been to our monastery, that's a famous cat. Excuse me. Because it was born in our monastery, raised in our monastery, the only time before this happened it left our monastery was when we took it to the vet in Byford to, as I say, get monasticized. <laughs> <laughs> and that's as far as it goes walks, but it doesn't go that far away. Cats in the bush eat birds. And it was eating so many birds that we thought a cat does not belong in the bush. So we decided to actually to send it to Waterman's. The lady who lived in Waterman's, she's not here this evening, very nice lady, we put the cat in the bag, we put the bag in the place, the back seat where your feet go, can't see out the window, can't even see out the bag. She took it all the way up the freeway to Waterman's took it in the bag into her house, kept it in the house for three days before she let it out into the garden. She thought she'd accustom it to its new home. As soon as she let it out, it bolted for the door. She ran after it, but that's a smart cat. It was much faster than her, she was. So she got in her car and drove in her car to try and find the cat. Couldn't find it. It was a Saturday in the summertime and I was on duty here in Nolamara. So she rang me saying, I'm very sorry, Ajahn Brahm, your cat's gone. And I said, never mind. I thought it actually would find its way back to our monastery in Serpentine. It was a smart cat, but it didn't do that. It was much smarter than that. In two hours' time, I heard this mewing at the front door over there. <laughs> and this cat had found its way from Waterman to here. In two hours, his poor paws were almost... Uh, 
were burning because it was a very hot day. And I gave it a saucer of milk, which it, it licked up in no time. I gave it about three saucers. And then it went to wee in the corner. <laughs> like it, but, you, <laughs> but you couldn't blame the poor cat. But how can a cat who's never been in a metropolitan area before, never been in Perth, never been further north than Byford, find its way from Waterman's to here, it's about six kilometres over the freeway, a straight line in two hours, and find you know, its owner or one of the monks. There's a resonance between people like that. So, understanding that as part of Buddhism, when I thought that I used to say sorry to my father, who died, I just went into a quiet place and thought of him. And then I said sorry. I did a little act of forgiveness. My dad, all those Jimi Hendrix records. I really, I'm really sorry did that, didn't mean to. I meant to, but I didn't really mean it to actually. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that I didn't love you and care for you. It's just um, I was being a 16 year old, that's all. And I thought of all the other things which he did and said thank you for all of those. And just you know, in the silence of that little ceremony, just told him how much I loved him and how much I cared for him. What a wonderful father he was, and how that those things which I wanted to tell him, now I could actually say to him. And you know that people can feel that. Maybe not in words, but they feel where it's coming from. And for me, it was a marvelous feeling of like release, release of the guilt of actually knowing a person and just growing up and just. And so I do that actually in funeral ceremonies. I ask people to be quiet. Think of the person who's passed away. Resonate with them. And whatever you wish to say to them. To undo all of the unfinished business. To say sorry. To say thank you. To say how much you love them. It's a marvellous freeing experience. Because when we talk about the grief, it's got so many layers there, and guilt is part of it. If you get rid of the guilt, then much more is easy to overcome. And the other layer, which I got rid of, or sort of not got rid of, but settled, was that when you love someone, when you care for them, when you've lived with them for a long time, there's always a sense of another part of debt. They've given so much to you. And you need to repay all the good times, the kindness, the care which they have given to you. And that was also part of my memory of my father's death. I owed him so much. It was only when I became a monk I realised, I was taught that in Buddhism we have this thing we call sharing of merits. What that really means is that you do an act of kindness, of goodness, of charity whether it's giving a donation, building a hut or whatever, or, or printing books, you know, good books which can help people see their way in life, books on meditation, on, on, on wisdom. And I went to Melbourne, just the reason I remember this, because I told this story in Melbourne, because when I me went to Melbourne for the first time, somebody appreciated what I was doing and gave a big donation. And they said to me, this is for the Buddhist Society in West Australia, but to be used as you want to use it, because we're giving it out of gratitude for what you've done. So when I came back, I asked the previous abbot, Ajahn Chakra, can I use this to give an offering in memory of my dad? I want to buy some Pali books, some Buddhist scriptures, so that I can put them in our monastery and inscribe on them in memory of William Betts, my father. It was wonderful that I was allowed to do that. We got some, it took about three months to get these books from England. And then I got somebody who's here this evening to actually inscribe them as best they could in beautiful calligraphy, in memory of William Betts, and for the name, the date of his birth and date of his death. And then I offered them to the monastery. 
it was marvellous for me to actually to give. Even as a monk it's so difficult because you don't have personal funds and money. But I wanted to give something for my dad. Because giving is part of loving. And when you live together, you give together, you share together. And it's one of those expressions which actually makes a sense of softness, community, relationship. And I did owe my father so much. It was a way for me to give back to him. I gave those things in memory of my dad and gave all the merit, all the good karma to him. Certainly it made me feel a certain sense of release from the debts one has to one's loved ones and parents. So it also becomes part of the ceremony for overcoming grief. Sometimes that those people who are saddled with grief, loss of a loved one, we want to do something, what do we have to do? Just getting advice is sometimes not enough. We need to do something, and that's a marvellous thing one can do. In the name of the person who's passed away, go and do some great act of charity in their name. Give all of the goodness for them. I owe you, and so I'm going to give something for others, which you will be proud of. And we ask forgiveness as well. And that way we can actually overcome much of the pain, much of the grief, the guilt, the unfinished business of a death, which will allow us to go back to that original idea of celebrating a life when all the other complications of death are overcome. Then we can go back to celebrating a life with someone we've known very well. Not only celebrating a life, but learning from the experience. Because all death tells us just how ephemeral this particular life is. People die at all times, children. I've been to funerals, of, obviously I've just said, from someone who's just stillborn. I remember going to a funeral of a, a boy who was only about three or four weeks when he died. I always remember this because the parents were so upset they didn't want to go to the funeral. They just sent me. They wanted to give their son a big send-off. So this was years ago. They, they hired a stretch limo on the first stretch limos to come to Perth. And the two funeral directors were in front of the stretch limo with me in the back and this small little coffin sort of on the other seat opposite. When we got to the traffic lights, people would always look in to see who's in the stretch limo. They couldn't see the little coffin there, but they could see me, so I waved. <laughs> I'm a Leo, I like going in stretch limos. <laughs> the only time I've been in stretch limousine. <laughs> but I've been to all sorts, of <laughs> all sorts of funerals, old people, young people, you die at any time. So don't ever think it's strange when a person dies or it's, something's gone wrong. Death happens at all times. When we understand life, we can actually celebrate that life. And when it's a a death. It's like the, the last part, the last movement of a great symphony. And that way we can be at peace with life and death. Sometimes you have short lives, sometimes you have long lives, sometimes it's in the middle. Just you've done, done it many, many times. So if you get a, a short straw this life, the chances are you get a longer straw the next life. It's just you know, what happens. So we don't need to be upset and afraid when death happens. We know that something goes on afterwards. It doesn't finish there. But we know that. What are we crying for? Why do we feel grief? Really, it's not only just a cultural accretion onto loss. It is not very useful. Everybody I've asked, when I ask them, when you die, do you want people to feel sad? They all say no. So why are we all so disobedient <laughs> to our loved one's wishes. <laughs> Nobody wants you to cry. So can't we learn a different way to deal with death? The one who's died doesn't want you to be unhappy. They want you to remember them, to learn from their life, to be enriched by the experience of their life, and to go on with a positive attitude, caring, sharing and being at peace with each other. So 
So if there's a, a funeral, I always say that the gift which we give to a person who's died is not the wreath of flowers which we lay on the coffin. That's an easy gift to give. I tell the people in the, the chapel, consider each one of you as flowers in this great wreath which are offering to the person who's died. You're offering your lives, the beauty of your lives, the goodness of your lives, the harmony of your lives, the love of your lives, in honor of the person who's died. Be good people, be caring people, be kind people, be generous people. That's the best way we can pay respect to someone who's died. It's the best gift I could give to my father when he died is trying to be a good son, someone he would be proud of, to be someone who remembered his examples and his goodness and tried to live them. And that is a way that we can take something positive out of the death of a person we know and we loved very much. We can actually grow from it, become better people for it. Just grieving, feeling sad about ourselves or sad about others doesn't help anybody. We know that. But we need ways and means to overcome that grief. And these are those ways and means. Just to summarize just what I've been saying. First of all, <coughs> we have to <coughs> let go of the guilt by doing a forgiveness ceremony. Let go and understanding that they, those people probably hear it and know it. The simile of those elephants and cats and people who resonate with each other in times of emotional intensity. And then do an act of generosity to pay back your debt to that person and celebrate their life rather than mourning their death. And learn from the whole experience. Become better people. But when we understand that life is so short, that death comes at any time, it means that life becomes more valuable. Time becomes something we don't want to kill or waste. Time becomes something which we must make best use of, not just to accumulate possessions, but to accumulate acts of kindness, acts of goodness, acts of sharing, acts of love. In Buddhism we call that good karma. So that's the meaning of life. When you have the opportunity, make that good karma as much as you possibly can. Then you'll be enriching your life. So when you die, you have no worries about where you will go. You will die peacefully. You will die happily. And people will be so proud that they knew you. That's the way to live. And that's the way to die. And that's the way to end this talk. Thank you for listening. Any questions about the talk on death and dying and grief and all that business? Yeah, go on. Yeah. <laughs> How long does it take for a person to get rebirth? It really depends. Sometimes if people are, are very angry and upset when they die, then they become like ghosts for long periods of time. Because sometimes, that, I don't know if you've ever had like dreams when you're not really quite sure whether you're awake or whether you're asleep. That's similar to what it's like being a ghost. Not really quite sure what's happening. The mindfulness, the alertness is very, very dull. So sometimes they can live for long periods of time not realizing they're dead. And that's what happens with a ghost. Whether it's a murder or any other accident or sudden death. Again, it really depends upon one's attitude towards those things. And if one has been training the mind for a long time to be peaceful, to be accepting of these things, then it won't be such a big deal. However, sometimes if a person especially is murdered, they get a lot of anger and a sense of injustice. As I said, I think a couple of weeks ago, these are just perceptions of injustice. So sometimes this is our old karma coming round to us when we may have killed other people. And now it's our turn to be killed. You know, people actually go to war, soldiers shoot people, people do murder each other. What happens to the, the murderers? Sometimes just going to jail or just going or getting away with it, it doesn't really settle the scores. It's something you know, more fundamental which needs to be settled. 
eventually sometimes they are murdered as well. In such times, such people, if they've really cultivated their mind, they can really let go and don't have any guilt, or, so don't have any anger for the person who did this. Have that sense of forgiveness, let go. And then they'll get reborn quite easily in a, a nice state. But it's like the anger and ill will, the attachments which we carry around with us, those are the ones which keep us suffering for a long time. So if you happen to get murdered, follow the example of one of the stories in the, in the old scriptures. There was a monk who ran into a group of bandits and they not only stole his robes, but after that's all the only possessions he had, stole his robes and bowl, <coughs> were about to sort of chop off his head with a sword. And he said, just please, just wait one moment. I just want to say that after you've killed me, please don't feel guilty about it. I give you full permission to cut off my head. I don't want you to suffer as a result of this. Then the bandits were so taken aback, they said, look, usually people actually are, are shaking before they're about to be killed. They usually beg for their lives, you know, citing their children or their wives or other people why they should be spared. But first of all, you're the first person we've come across who's not afraid of death. And number two, you're not even thinking of yourself, you're thinking of me and how I feel after I've killed you. You know, you're the first person who's actually shown compassion to me. And we asked him why, what have you been doing? And he told him all about Buddhism, Dharma and compassion and forgiveness. And that bandit chief threw down his sword gave up being a bandit and followed that monk as his disciple, became a monk himself. And all the other bandits, some of them became monks, the others just disbanded and went back home and got proper jobs. <laughs> That's in the Buddhist scriptures. <laughs> I believe that happened. The power of like compassion and wisdom is so strong, it can melt people, it can melt even bandits. And the point was that when he was about to be murdered, he was not only not showing fear, but showing compassion to your murderer. Please don't feel bad about this afterwards. I give you full permission to kill me. Could you do that? <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually what we could do. So take away all this sort of hatred which we have for other people. Maybe it's our past karma or whatever, who knows. But it's only one line. They're, just, they're not killing you. They're just sort of taking away the body, get another body afterwards. <laughs> might get a better one next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go on. I think, um, suicide is a very good one. Again, it really depends why a person commits suicide. There are sometimes people who commit that like, euthanasia, and these are people sometimes who are in such pain or such psychological distress. Mr. Dent, the first person in Australia to commit legalized euthanasia in the Northern Territory, was a Buddhist. And the reason why he decided to commit legalized euthanasia was not because of his own pain or his own disease. It was out of concern for his wife. We knew him. His wife had to give him 24 hours of care and had no life of her own. She had to be with him all the time. He'd wake up in the middle of the night. She had to look after him, care for him. And there was a toll on his wife which he thought was unacceptable. If it was just himself, he would just bear it. So he decided to take legal euthanasia out of compassion for his wife. In such a situation, it's so hard to judge and condemn. In other cases, like in more extreme cases, sometimes it's because a boy has lost his girlfriend. Sometimes they've killed themselves, committed suicide. In such a case, <coughs> it's they go, they commit that suicide with lots of negativity, lots of pain in their heart. And when they kill themselves, they're still there afterwards. They just destroy their body. But they don't destroy their mind with the problem. Which is why that if a person commits suicide, it doesn't solve anything. They're still in pain. 
which is why if there is a suicide, it usually you know, the monks or someone goes around actually to talk to that person as if they were still there, to try and relieve them of the suffering, the reason why they committed suicide in the first place, and secondly, to actually to forgive them for actually the act of killing themselves. Imagine if you did that. You don't need sort of, you need like forgiveness, you need support, you need help to ease that, ease your way out of that problem. So as a monk, we look upon that being who just committed suicide as still being there, lingering around in great confusion and trying to actually appease them. Same way I'm talking to you. You talk to those beings. We try and heal them, help them and free them. So they go and uh, learn their mistakes and just learn from their mistakes and just go and get a proper birth again and, and don't do it again. So that's what happens with suicides. Trouble with suicide is that very often actually people who commit suicide in their previous life do it again. Because it becomes like almost like a habit. It becomes like an escape mechanism when life gets tough. Instead of actually uh, facing it and finding solutions, you kill oneself. And that becomes like a habit for the next life. When you get you know, difficulties and troubles in your life, that becomes an option. So it's another problem that it's like a habit which actually uh, goes from life to life. You know what habits are like. Sometimes they're hard to get sort of get over them. Much worse than picking your nose. <laughs> At the back, question. Abortion is the same because I gave a talk on this just a couple of days ago in Melbourne. Like, how can? myself as a monk, as a man, judge a woman who decides to have an abortion. Sometimes, uh, this is all a question on right and wrong. I always tell people, to actually to know what's right and wrong, you've got to follow your gut, the gut feeling. But there's one exception, and that's if you've got irritable bowel syndrome, then don't, never follow your gut. Because <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned the case when I was in Singapore recently, on Talkback Radio, a person who's one of these um, uh, free, psycho free psychologists. I think there was a program in the United States called Fraser or something about a... Uh, it happens in many countries. They have like these radio psychologists. You just ring up for free and you get free psych psychological advice. So I was on this program giving free psychological advice and religious advice. Dial a monk. <laughs> and, <laughs> and this guy rang up and said... I'm, ha I'm married, but I'm having an affair with another woman. Is it right? My answer was, if it was right, you wouldn't be asking me. <laughs> because we ask those questions, because we know it's wrong, but we want actually someone to say it's right, to assuage our guilt. That's why we ask questions of people very often. We know inside whether it's right or wrong. It's the same with abortions. The woman is the one who will know whether it's right or wrong. If she can overcome fear, overcome fear of like breaking some law of society's condemnation or acceptance or whatever, the thing is we complicate the issue so much. So I would never actually say, I'd never come up and say abortion is right or abortion is wrong. Because that just, you can't say such things. There's always those cases. You know, some weird cases, strange cases. So if a woman actually, it's e e easy to say that sort of in a forum like this, but if that happens, sometimes a woman comes up in front of you. And it's not just a theory, it's a real thing. It's a real situation. The real situations are very different. And sort of standing back and saying, yeah, this is right, yeah, this is wrong, because of this and because of that. In the real situation, it all changes. So I just like dealing with real, in a real situation, you try and clear away all the complications so the person can actually make that decision well informed, with support, saying whatever you decide, I'll always look after you and care for you and support you. I'll never criticize you for your decisions. I'll try and help you make the decision, but the decision is yours. 
I'll support you because of it. And whatever outcome, if you have the child, I'll try and support you, look after that child. And if you decide for the abortion, I'll support you there as well, emotionally, psychologically. You have to allow the person to make the decision themselves, to take responsibility for their karma. But when we say it's right or it's wrong, it's just in theory. In fact, this is always occasions. There was one in England when I was visiting last time. A woman had two, had twins, and there's some sort of complication. As far as the doctors were concerned, if she went ahead with her pregnancy, all three would die. If the doctors terminated one of those twins' lives, killed them, then the other, the other twin would survive, and so would the woman. One of those occasions, well, what would you do? It's basically a choice between killing one or killing three by inaction. There's a great debate, and I was actually quite interested in this, but apparently the debate was to stop because the doctor just acted and just aborted one of the fetuses so the other one and the woman could survive. It was just so obvious to me that was had to be the way to go. So sometimes there's always those strange cases where you can't really say it. So you'd always support the person taking responsibility. Rather than coming down from on high, Buddhism say, or I say, you can't do this, you can't do that. It has to come from the heart. You know. And you know much better than I do what's right and what's wrong. One last question before we finish because it's going late. Yeah. Oh, that's actually referring to, there's no individual doer. That's just referring to the idea of non-self, which is a whole different talk, which would take hours to actually go. What it's actually saying is that, you know, you s- who said that? So there is, you know, you're always changing every moment, different person, different character, different body. If I could magic up you when you were only, say, 10 years of age, and I put you beside you, you wouldn't be able to recognize that you were sort of, you came from that little boy. If I could magic up me when I was 16 or 17, you could have never imagined this guy with his big beard and bushy hair and, and hippie beads would be Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> It'd be completely unrecognizable. Yes, absolutely. That's a scary part, which comes another. Did you actually choose to ask that question? Or was it all conditioned for many, many things in the past? Oh no, that choice is, you do choose. You can actually see choice happening. You can actually observe choice. So choice is real. But the point is that we give it a meaning it doesn't deserve. We think that we are the ones who are choosing, rather than noticing there's a whole complex process of cause and effect. Guilt is, people do feel guilt, but they don't need to, there's an alternative there. A lot of time it does actually come from a sense of of self and attachment to things. That's why when I I gave a a speech once at a grief and loss conference, one lady came up afterwards and she'd been grieving for, I think, a son who died tragically about two years previously. And even though I told all these stories, as she said, that just really hurt her. Because actually I was challenging her to give up her grief. And she identified with her grief so much, she went to all these grief conferences. She was a grieving person. That's who she was. And I was actually destroying her identity by telling her to forgive her grief. Sometimes people get into these ruts, where they're the angry person, or they're the schizophrenic person or they're the criminal or whatever, they identify with that so much they don't want to give it up. That becomes them. So that's why you have to get people who get into grief, get them very quickly before they become the grieving person. 
known to their friends as someone who's sad. They get reinforced by their friends and by themselves as being that person, the one who's always sad. So thank you for that question and thank you for listening today. It's gone an extra, but we're not going to charge you overtime this evening.